Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Monster Island. Shall we word? We should, yes. Do you want to go first or will I? Um, that's an excellent question. Oh, uh, you, you I, seem I'll go first because I just have a, a fairly... Uh, I am slightly conflicted I, because I have a very short word. But first, okay. we have two new Patreon sponsors to thank. Oh, that's amazing So news. we have two gentlemen, one named Tim and one named Thomas, and they have signed up to join the... Small but mighty legion of Lexitecture word nerd supporters on Patreon, and we are deeply appreciative of them we for are it. Deeply appreciative of them for it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Thomas. I really want to call you Tom and Timus, just because that's how my brain works. Even though, like, I'm going yeah. to assume you don't know each other, let alone you're like a comedy double act. Um, so I, <laughs> now that I've acknowledged that I want to do that thing, I I won't do it. Although I think I just did. But thank you, Tim, yeah. and thank you, Thomas, and thank you to all the other and Patreon supporters and the people who support us in all manner of ways. All the other ways, too, yes. And if you two would like to take a run at doing a comedy duo act, just because, let me know, and I'll give each other your email addresses. You guys can connect. and That would be so beautiful. And wow the world yeah. with your Tom Timisery. And I would feel like I'd like given uh, birth to something. Yeah, yeah we've, we've created a... Well, well, I guess we'll find out if we've created a monster or not. <laughs> oh, that's I mean, we that's probably won't find out. Incredibly funny. That's really funny <laughs> for reasons that will become clear during this podcast episode. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go first. Cool. So, my word today is island. Awesome. And I'm. I've just never known. Basically, I've just never known why there's an S in island. And I wanted to look it up. Do you know, I it feel didn't make like any sense to me. I feel like I've looked this up before, because I too wanted to know why there was an S in Ireland, or maybe I've read an article about it or something like that. But it is a okay. good, valid question, and one which I definitely answered for myself. And now I have completely forgotten. So, oh, good. re-enlighten because me, please. This this whole thing really just turns on it on two sort of fact fact nugget elements of this awesome i love that this. if they're not a surprise to you it, it sort of really is going to take the wind out of myself so i'm glad you've forgotten so that's awesome and <laughs> you if you do remember rely on pretend me to forget like you've forgotten things, Ryan, always <laughs> fair fair <laughs> enough uh so the first thing is island is a very very old word even by the old words we sometimes look at on this show standards mm -hmm. first citation is from 888 oh wow that is old good old king alfred it, right Super old, and essentially, this is gonna this is gonna be an inauspicious start to a an etymology podcast segment. But it's sort of just always meant what it means today. That's that's fair. Sometimes that happens. A chunk of land surrounded by water. It, it, it wasn't until weirdly, it wasn't until sort of the start of the 1600s that you start to get a lot of metaphorical and illustrative uses of it. Okay. So, like, a, an island could mean you can have it referred to a, a, um, a patch no of grassland is in the island, forest, for example, or a mount, or that. You're right. Or then eventually Simon and Garfunkel refuting that and saying, "No, up yours. I am a rock. I am an island." <laughs> but I always thought that was a little petty of them. And a rock feels but, no pain, it, and an island <laughs> never cries, etc. There you go. I mean, yeah, it's it's probably true. Although islands somehow have like. Rivers and waterfalls coming down? Is that the... Anyway, we're anthropomorphizing islands too much already. And I'm only two paragraphs into my notes, and Listen, that's a bad I, sign. I just don't think um, there's enough anthropomorphization in the world. I really don't. It's true. The So I thought that was weird. I thought it was like it took eight centuries, basically, to for someone to be like, hey, we could also use this to refer to people or other things that mm. are stand out from their surroundings or whatever. But anyway, so that's how... Pardon the pun, or don't, I don't care. Uh, rock solid, this word is, because <laughs> it's just Boom. Been, been there for forever. Uh, always meant the same thing. So, 
initially I saw that and I was like, oh, well, this isn't going to, I mean, there's not really a lot here to talk about. So I'll just, I'll look up the thing I came here to see and then I'll move on and that will be that. But that wasn't that because I think what I've discovered here, it, so you know the concept of false friends yes. like between languages where you get like absolutely words in two different languages that look like they really ought to be related, but they actually mean like totally different things and are unrelated my favorite, entirely. My favorite, favorite pair of false friends is embarrassed and embarazada. Right. Do you know this one? Stuff like that. Like you're like, oh, this. In I, English, think heard, I think we did it. It came possibly. up when we did embarrassed, but I, I've, yeah. I've forgotten handily enough. Embarrassed means, you know, <laughs> embarrassed. And in Spanish, embarazada yeah. means to be pregnant. Oh, that's right. That's what and it And there's, there's a bit of your brain yeah. that can go, oh, was it such a shameful thing? To... No, no, there is it's no etymological uh, connection. As far as I recall, it's it's just yeah. proper false friends. Yeah. So this isn't, this is, and there's going to be a word for this. And it's going to be known by people who are smarter than me, but those people aren't me because otherwise I would be smarter than me and that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's, but what, what I found here is one of the biggest examples of just words that everyone, I assume, automatically thinks are related. Like if you ask two people, if you ask a hundred people, whether these two words are related, I would imagine a hundred people would say yes. But in fact... The word island is not etymologically connected to the word isle. No I -S -L -E. way. Those are different words entirely come with on, entirely man. different histories, no, right? Come on. So this no. is what made me do this. I was like, now You're I have to do nonsense. this because <laughs> because now I have to do this because it because what? So yeah. more on that in a little bit, but that's the headline is it's, they're not related, which is just, it still blows my mind. Yeah, wowzers. So, island comes through, the is a Germanic word, hence why it's around in 888 sure. and stuff. And it's basically like, it's 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 such an old word that uh, Old English, Old Norse, and Old Frisian all did the same thing to it for the same reason. And that is, they stuck the word land on the end of it. Okay. Because... It originally was just, and I, I don't know, basically just, it's presented in different ways, but it's that I, the I sound, the, the first syllable mm -hmm. of island used to be the whole word. And it just means water. It just comes from the pi root, A-K-W-A, meaning water, oh which is where God. we get all the aqua prefer, like prefixes, uh, aquifer, aqueduct, where Spanish gets agua for water, all that stuff. Waterland. So... It literally just means the watery place wow. or a place in the water. So the land had nothing to do with it, really. It wasn't It wasn't the important thing about it. The important thing to know about it was that it was surrounded by water in a big and overwhelming way, which I think is one of these things that I'm, I might, I may completely well be reading too much into this, but it's one of these things that makes me think about what we might be able to learn about how people used to think about stuff from the way words have evolved and changed and the way our terms change. Yeah. Because as we see cause with I'm a rock, I'm an island, like the, the island, the thing about an island that people know, I feel like now is we're focused on the thing itself, not what's around it. But it was context that was the important thing originally because the whole word just was water. And then eventually... Again, Old Norse, Old Frisian, and Old English all went, it's a little confusing that we call that thing water. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's surrounded by water, but it itself is not water. So I, I like we should probably think, just stick land on the end of it. I like to think there was a meeting at some point. They were like, dude, yeah. dude like, we, <laughs> yeah. we need to sort out some of these words. Can, can we like, what are yeah. you doing on Tuesday? Or whatever the hell they call the days. And we've talked about that in great detail. Super duper cool system yeah. of naming days. But whatever you're doing on that day, we all need to sit down somewhere. Bring some beer. It's good. We'll have a symposium, and um, yeah. we'll we'll sort out the words first on the yeah. agenda. Can you imagine the beards at that meeting? Oh, so many beards! Like, and that's just the, the women. The beard power. Kaboom, kaboom. Of, <laughs> of old English, old Norse, and old Frisian. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Facial hair alone, just one for the ages. So, 
Yeah, it was just that one thing, and it was all about context. So just watery place oh, or oh, sorry. thing I, on just, the water. So the beards, for some reason, made me think of axes and sharp implements like the dwarves and Terry Pratchett, which made me think, I, I right. hope nobody brought really sharp, brutal weapons to the meeting. And then the phrase, the war of the words, uh, popped into my head, and now somebody needs to write that book. <laughs> Agreed. Onward. Get on it, writing Twitter. <laughs> so... Yeah, they basically just did the same thing. They Like, we should add land. Yeah. But even after it had the land added to it, it was essentially just spelled I or Y, L-A-N-D, mm -hmm. sometimes with an E on the end, or some variation of that. But the S was not there. The S came from that tendency that people had at one time in history to really want... It became fashionable for English spelling to reflect... Latin origins, even if those origins didn't exist. Yeah, I blame Johnson so that's why for we this, get... which is a bit unfair. Yeah. But he was rude about my country, so therefore, um, I, I'm, yeah. I'm happy. Happy to. Yeah, it. fair enough. It's it's why a lot of the bees show up, like debt, and yes. you know, there's a lot of the silent letters that we kind of look at and go, "What are you doing there?" And what and, they're and doing why... there is fulfilling. Yeah, and, and why the rule came into English that uh, one should never split an infinitive. Like, that's stupid. Yeah, stuff like that. Just because you can't do like, it in Latin doesn't mean you shouldn't do it in a completely different language. It, exactly. Like, what what those silent letters are doing there is fulfilling some medieval scribe's vision Vanity. of how much cooler it would be if Latin and English were closer related. Anyway, yeah. so, but this the S in Ireland comes from wanting to make Ireland look more like Isle, that word okay. to which it is not related. So, I mean, that's I wild. guess they are related in that sense because that's where the S comes from. But Isle comes from uh, the French, il, okay. meaning island, and from the Latin insula, which is where the the French get their Isle, il from. Mm -hmm. But so it's a totally different history. It doesn't, it doesn't, they don't cross at any other point other than just Isle Lens Island, the S. And even in that case, they it, were forced to meet. Yeah, and they were shoved together by some nerd. Um, yeah, and so Edam Online has a... Essentially, Insula, the origin of Insula is one of these dubious history, unknown origin, sure. speculative waters ahead, you know, ye, fairly warned be ye, says I. But... <laughs> One of the theories, which I quite like, is that insula comes from a compound along the lines of in salo, meaning in the salt, or in the, oh, that's in the ocean, lovely. in the salty yeah. sea. So I like that. I want that to be true. It also points out that the, the obvious point that not all islands are in the ocean, and sure. not all cultures that would have involved been involved in the development of language were even by the ocean themselves and that uh, apparently there's a lot of or there's evidence to suggest that the very very early uses like indo-european and proto-indo-european families um more often and more early would talk about islands and rivers using the same kind of family of words so those obviously yeah, sure. wouldn't be salty but anyway i like the in the salt thing yeah. As a, I hope that's right, because I think it's cool. <laughs> but it yeah, is, so that's it is super interesting that that notion, like like you say, that I I know that that we are we're we're wildly speculating, and we're both people who who kind of like to do that, and we're, you know we're both people with yeah. creative ideas in our heads, and we like a good story. But but the notion that it all depends on where you're standing when you make up the word. So like if you live <laughs> yeah. on an island, then. That is your world, presumably, in, you know, 888. Um, somebody's gotten around to inventing boats, perhaps, and, and, and you're like, oh, there's more to the world than this. Awesome. But yeah. when that's the whole world, what's the biggest kind of single thing on your mind about that place where you live? Everywhere you look, there's water. It's only when you can look at things from the water that you start to think about how to describe the land. Or at least that's that's what I'm thinking. That's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't yeah. even thought of it that way. That's 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 what like when you when you said about, you know, 
the, the idea of we better add in some land here, guys. You know, does does that impulse come yeah. from the fact that, yeah, as I say, until until you've been on the water and and perhaps you know been out of sight of land and realised, oh, actually, we are not the centre of the universe. We're not the centre of this terrain. Um, there are other ones that oh, look, yeah. we have to like sail for three days and then suddenly we find another one. Um, I yeah. yeah, I hadn't even I hadn't even pictured it from that perspective, which is I don't live on an island, so I guess fair enough. But yeah, yeah, that's it's, also it's... really interesting because I didn't um, I didn't write it down in my notes, and I almost forgot to even talk about it. But the, so the word land that suffix. Yeah. The interesting thing about that is that in its earliest form, so you know how you talk about um, a country is in or, or someone's Scotland. lands, like yeah. our land is this. Yeah. That is earlier than the more broad definition of land to just be the surface of the earth. Ah, oh, that's cool. So in the phrase our lands... The stuff like, that's mine is the earlier possessive than is the being stuff applied. that belongs to everybody. Yeah. The possessive is the inherent use of lands. And then it got dropped off and land just became a generic term for the ground under all of our feet. But it was originally used just to describe a country. Like, that's the most human being accurate thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Based on my experiences <laughs> yeah, exactly. of how we behave in groups, you know? Yeah. yeah. But it, it's sort of similar to the, you know, the, what tweaked it in my head is that a, your, your analogy of like, all you see around you is water and this, and then it's like, oh, there's other things too. Now I got to look back and apply something different or change yeah. based on where you're standing. And it's it's that exact thing that happened with the, the word and the suffix land in this case. That's super cool. So yeah, that's island. Just island. a little short one, but those, I could not believe that those two weren't related. Yeah. I was like, that no. Everything on the internet is lying to me right now. I don't know why, but yeah, crazy. Cool. So, I'm uh, I'm delighted. I mean, Island was a, a, a super cool word. I very much enjoyed you, you talking about it. But, you know, whoever goes first gets to know before the other person what the title of the episode is going to be. And I, I'm just really, really excited <laughs> about an episode called Monster Island. Oh, that's so cool. You know, what? what's... Like, you'd see <laughs> so, that film. I'm so happy. Right? Monster Island. <laughs> of course. Even if it's got... You know what's crazy is I actually I actually kind of hoped that was going to be your word. <laughs> when you were excited when you were excited about Island, I was like, <gasps> I hope she's doing monster. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said earlier, let's see if we've created a monster. Um, and I, I did one of those <laughs> laughs inside my own head oh, because nice. um, that's, that's what I've got for you today. Um, good awesome. old Monster Island. And part of the reason why, in fact, a huge part of the reason why I, I wanted to talk about this word is because I have been reading the extremely excellent young adult, I hate the term young adult novel, but it is a young adult novel. The reason I hate right. the term young adult is because it, it cuts off a whole spectrum of readers who go, oh, it's for kids, I'm not going to bother reading that. And right, yeah. that, that pisses me off a lot. And the, the, I read an article about this that hadn't really occurred to me. And I read an article that pointed out that To Kill a Mockingbird, if it was published today, would be classed as a young adult novel because the protagonists oh, are children. Yeah, and that's probably true. Th the thought that um, the, the adults would go, oh, I, I'm not going to read that, it's just for kids, and miss out on the, the opportunity of reading To Kill a Mockingbird is, is a really, you know, that's a terrifying thing. Yeah. I suppose you could say the same about, about other, you know, like The Catcher in the Rye, that would be another example. Um, pretty much everything that Tolkien yeah. wrote would probably be classed as young, or even worse, young adult fantasy. Oh, like oh, magic and wizards nobody's and stuff reading for that. kids. Nobody's reading that. So, yeah. um, because I'm an English teacher, obviously, I read a lot of books that are marketed towards uh, children and teenagers. And I'm very, very glad that I get to do so, because otherwise I might not have read A Monster Calls. Do you know this book? I don't know it. It is whew, awesome. Really, really Honest. excellent. It's by Patrick Ness, who is a British, um, again, children's young adult novelist who has won every prize that exists in British um, children's <laughs> fiction. And, wow. and rightly so. 
And he, the first time I read Patrick Ness was a, it was ironically, so the school that I'm working in now is the school where I did my very first teaching placement as a student. Oh, cool. And while I was there, I had a class of, oh, maybe S2, S3. So pupils who were about 14, 15. And one of the kids in one of those classes was reading this book and recommended it to me. And it was called The Knife of Never Letting Go, which is a super cool title. And, it is. And I, I asked her, oh, I said, what are you reading? Is it interesting? What's it about? And she told me a little bit about it. And she said, it's amazing. You should read it. And I did. And she was right. And it was the first book in a trilogy. The trilogy is called Monsters of Men. And there's recently been a film made with Tom Holland. The the premise of oh. the, the, the sort of it's it's a complicated trilogy to explain, as trilogies often are. But the protagonist is a young boy called Todd who lives on a lives in a town on this sort of other world other planet it's not really made super clear where they are and what's going on but um there's no women there's only men and everyone can hear everybody else's thoughts oh yeah so they call it the noise <laughs> which is rather beautiful and yeah. you can also hear the thoughts of animals so one of the first things that happens in in the novel in in the knife of never letting go todd the main character has a dog and the dog's going, I need a poo, Todd. Todd, I need a poo. I need a poo. Todd, Todd, I need a poo. <laughs> and the dog <laughs> speaks exactly the way you would imagine a dog. You know, if you've ever looked at, at your pet and thought, what's going on in your little brain? It's almost always, love me, give me food. Can I have something? What's that? I want a thing. What's that? What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I need a poo. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's really great. I very much enjoyed it. Um, so I read, I read the trilogy. I liked it so much I gave it to a few other people. And then I did that really stupid thing where I'd found an author who I really enjoyed and never read anything by that same author ever again. <laughs> until now. <laughs> right. So the interesting right. thing about A Monster Calls is that Patrick Ness didn't come up with the concept for the book. The idea for the novel was created by a woman called Siobhan O'Dowd. Siobhan Dowd, I now need to check that to make sure I get her name right. That's that's important. She is she was also a young adult. Um, writer of fiction and she died at a shockingly young age from cancer and mm. she had the idea for this book but she didn't have the time to write it so she asked Patrick Ness to do it for her and they oh. didn't they didn't know each other I think she maybe just picked out her favourite children's author and thought probably he's going to say yes and he did um, and he wrote this wow. book and it's about a young boy called Connor and Connor's mother is dying of cancer. And a monster calls Connor is visited by this monster. And I don't really want to say very much more about it than that. Other than okay. I'm going to cry all over the class that I'm reading it with. Without a doubt. <laughs> right. And I expect that probably, so even though they're like hardened teenagers who are cynical about everything, they're going to cry too because it is like being punched in the heart. But it's also right. incredibly beautiful, really, really well written. You'll like I I'm I just can't stop thinking about this book. There's so much in it. Huh. And it's also been made into a film, which I haven't seen, which I'm really curious about given the nature of the book. Um, okay. Yeah. But but it, it's just, it's absolutely wonderful. And, you know, like, my, my dad died of cancer. And it's fucking horrible. And yeah. the book is really, really good at describing what that horror is like, but also not making it over horrible. You, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, yeah. Like, it's a, it's a giant shit sandwich, however you look at it. But um, it, I I wouldn't say it's a pessimistic book by by any measure. But I just I, I absolutely loved it. Anyway, so hmm. I I wondered to myself about the word monster, and here's what I found out. So the OED first cool. sights monster as uh, appearing and writing first in Chaucer's The Monk's Tale, circa thirteen seventy five. Um, 
was never wh white Sith that this world began that slew so many monsters as did he. Talking about Hercules, that's the, the monk's tale. So uh, there right. was nobody ever since the start of the world that, that s killed as many monsters as, as this person did. And the OED defines it as originally a mythical creature, which is part animal and part human, or combines elements of two or more animal forms and is frequently of great size and ferocious appearance. Later, more generally, any imaginary creature that is large, ugly and frightening. That seems pretty standard. When we think of monsters, yeah. this is sort of what we think about. Yeah. Um, Etym Online has a slightly different take on the definition, which I found interesting. Here's what it says. So early 14th century, um, agreed, monstre, M-O-N-S-T-R-E, malformed animal or human, creature afflicted with a birth defect. Those two things are not R the same. Oh, yeah, no. Now... Etym Online does point out that by the late 14th century, this sense had been extended to fabulous animals composed of parts of creatures. So I right. find it very interesting to find that the OED go straight to that meaning and they, they don't have this sense of, um, you know, a, a human being or an animal that's not quite the shape you expected it to be. Let's Let's look at it like right. that. Right, yeah. However, that that same that same sort of event also has within it the the um, the shade of an omen, a portent, um, a, a warning yeah. that something wicked this way comes. If you like, something bad is is going on. And I was right. like, oh, okay, that's hmm, problematic in a lot of senses. Interesting. Yeah. Understandable, <laughs> I think, yeah. given given the time that these meetings were happening <laughs> with the very sharp axes. And um, the OED says this about its, its etymology. It's Anglo-Norman and Middle French, so we have monstre and moustre. Um, however, we are, it's very close. It says in Old French as Mostre, M-O-S-T-R-E, in, in the sense of prodigy or marvel, the first half of the 13th century in senses disfigured person and misshapen being. And then in, an, in the extended sense applied to a pagan. And then we, we get to the sense of a portent or a prodigy. And I'm like, th those those things don't mean that those, are, those definitions aren't the same. So classical Latin mm -hmm. had this word monstrum, which is variously defined as a portent, a prodigy, a monstrous creature, a wicked person, a monstrous act or an atrocity. And I spent a lot of time looking at this Latin root monstrum. It seems pretty clear looking at the form of the English word that, that this has influenced the etymology and the meaning of the English word that we have. So I, I had a little look at it. I, I did a little bit of, of digging and I found this really lovely uh, article from triblive.com, which I, a website that I hadn't seen before. And the title is Latin verb is the monster behind many words. And it talks about the, the noun form monstrum of that Latin word being originally mm -hmm. from the verb monere, M-O-N-E-R-E. And monere means to warn or to advise. Okay. So, in fact, a monster is something that warns you of something. And that, to me, seems much clearer, much more clearly linked to that sense of an omen, you know? Right, an omen yeah. omen is, is a warning. Yes. Look out, something bad is going to happen or something bad is on its way. Mm -hmm. And... Monere can be traced back to the, the pi root M-E-N, men. Now, I honestly feel like I could have researched this word for 20 years and I would still be going, ah, <laughs> cool. Um, I, I, can't possibly, I can't possibly cover all of the stuff to say about this word in one podcast episode, but please go and have a look because it's just so super duper cool. Um, first, I'm going to Neat. talk about men, and I'm going to come back to Mon um, briefly also, because you probably recognise this root 
and it's probably in a lot of words that you didn't realise had connections to the sense of warning. So the yeah. pirate men means to think. Now... Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that covers a whole lot of conceptual ground. Like, it sure does. If I was to say to you, are you thinking? You, you could say, yeah, I'm thinking. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to have a think too. Let's both think. Are we thinking about the same things? Are we even doing the same thing? Can we know right. that the other person is doing the thing that we are doing and having the same experience of it? No, of course not, because thinking is entirely abstract. And so yeah. this, this is, like, it's, it's interesting. The, um, the, the Etym Online entry for Monster um, talks about Pi Monieie, M-O-N-E-I-E, which it defines as to make think of or to remind. Now, I couldn't find out much more about this pirate. Obviously, you know, Etym Online is a good source. Um, it, it'll be from somewhere reasonable and reputable, but, but I, I personally couldn't find out more about it. I maybe needed some real life books and a real life library to, to investigate that a bit further. But money was the, the causative form of the root men to think. And that makes sense. And it, it also makes a lot of sense to me that the, the word to think spawns a lot of, as I say, you know, different kind of conceptual categories. Because if you want to describe right. what thinking is like, you need a lot of extra words. You like, it's hard to describe that thing. Yeah. You can't just say that, that you know, it's this, like water, you can say that, that is the thing I can see and touch. You're definitely yeah. talking about the same thing when, when we talk about that. So this sense of a kind of a shared understanding of what thinking is, um, I think is, is part of what makes this word so interesting. So here is the list of cognates on Etym Online. And the, we could literally just talk about the list of cognates that there's there's so many. Um, but Etym Online says it forms all or part of admonish. So the men and the mon part, we'll see a lot of that. This word, which like just sometimes you just get stopped in your tracks when you're looking at a list of words, and Ahur, Ahura Mazda is one of those words. <laughs> what? Yeah, Ahura Mazda is <laughs> it is in fact two words, and they are capitalized, and it is from Avestan Ahura, which means spirit or lord, from Indo-Iranian Asuras, from the suffixed form of Pirut Ansu, meaning spirit plus Avestan Mazda, wise. So it basically means wise lord, or wise spirit. Ahura wow. Mazda. Super cool. You know, like, again, I'd go and see cool. that film. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to see that band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we have Admonish and Ahura Mazda. We have Ament and Ementia. We have words like Amnesia, Amnesty, Amnesis, right. Anamnestic. Automatic, automaton, uh, comment, dement, uh, yeah. demonstrate, the, the mon part right. rather than the men part, yeah. idiomatic, maenad, oh. the suffix mansi, as in necromancy, rhabdomancy, right, yes. all of the cool mansi words, uh, mandarin, mania, mantis, huh. mantra, memento, Right. Mens rea, mental, mention, mentor, Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, uh, mnemonic and oh. mnemosyne, mnemosyne, wait a minute, mnemosyne, Sorry? the goddess of memory. <laughs> Menes really do make my brain hurt. Menes, that's, that's <laughs> clearly what I mean when I see M followed by M. Uh, money, right. monitor, monster, monument, mosaic, muse, museum, music, muster, Premonition, reminiscence, reminiscent, and summon. And I oh. looked at that list and thought, what about the word? It's just, it's yeah. so wide ranging. There are so many words in there that mean completely different things. But also, when you take the, the, the kernel of the idea that says these words all have something to do with thinking, your brain goes, oh, right. Because of course yeah. it does. Yeah. So let's take, for example, monument. What are monuments for? Right. They're there to yeah, help you rem remember. 
and when you remember things, something, think you them. think about it. Yeah. Um, amnesia, so the, the M-N-E meaning sort of memory part, obviously related to thinking. Premonition, a pre-warning is what a premonition is. Um, right, yeah. I had never made the connection between amnesia and amnesty before, but it makes it makes sense because if some if there's amnesty granted, you are forgetting the thing that the amnesty absolves someone from. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's and, interesting. And then I, I I took a look at the the wonderful index of Pocorny's uh, pirates from the good old University of Texas at Austin's excellent website. And and I I found a whole lot more, you know. It's just you, you find yourself going, but oh, but yeah, of course. Like you almost start yeah. off with, but why, <laughs> and then find yourself going, oh yeah. So it, like words like um, amnesis, uh, sorry, anamnesis, a reminiscence or calling to mind. Right. A lot of these are are the, you know the oh, same man. words that are that are on the list. Oh, mention. I can't remember if I said that. Mention and mentor. People who are oh, wise or people who too. think or people who remind you of things. Um, yeah. A museum. A place where you oh. go and think <laughs> about, the, you, you know. And and it, it was just such a, oh, right, kind of moment for me to, to see that, that all of these... Um, all of these 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 things are related, and so the the Pocorni etymon, as as they call pirates, men to think, they also define as mind or spiritual activity. I think again, it kind of reflects this notion of of, of how it's a tricky thing to pin down that sense yeah. of, of meaning. Um, and a, another curious little turn that I found so. Monere, that that Latin uh, verb, has also fallen into English in a, a a pretty obscure and perhaps obsolete word, monio, which literally means, if you look at hmm. you know if you if you do your Latin, amo amasamat, it means I warn. Right. And so oh, monio okay. in the OED is defined as a reminder, a warning. Specifically at Oxford University, it's a formal reminder of a university function. So if you had been invited okay. to Lord Muckety Muck's Ball as part of the <laughs> university calendar, you would receive a monio, a, a warning, a reminder to say, don't forget that you have this thing. Yeah. So That's very cool. From being warned oh, or being advised um, that... The, an omen or a bad thing was perhaps coming, signalled by an animal or a human being born not in the shape that you expected it to be. We then have this this next sort of sense of um, of monstrousness of, of things that are difficult to look at. Interestingly, too, there's um, there's an equivalent in Greek. The equivalent in Greek is the word. I'm gonna to have to. I'm gonna to have to just double check this. It is teras, <laughs> and teras, Greek, mm -hmm. gives us the word teratology. And teratology is the study of birth defects. Okay. And so you get teratogens. Wow. Teratogens are like literally things which cause um, right. teras. So alcohol and certain types of chemicals and drugs are teratogenic. If you take them or if you're exposed to them while you are uh, while you're pregnant, then um, your your baby may be born not in the shape or the condition you were expecting it to be. And yeah. teras, the Greek word, is defined as one a sign, a marvel, or a wonder. Mm. Which is a much nicer way of looking at that situation, I think, than uh, <laughs> yeah, than it's sure perhaps is. shaded by um by by what I was just saying. Number two, a divine sign, an omen or a portent, and then number three, a monster. So interesting. Yeah, hugely interesting that that this sense of um, you know, I think if you say to the average person on the street these days, "What's a monster?" they'd probably think of Godzilla. You know, the kind of comic book big budget yeah. blockbuster film monsters. Um, Definitely. But yeah, 
all that was happening really was cool. that we were perhaps being warned. So, Monster Nifty. Island. That's, oh, Monster Island. I would go to Lord Muckety Muck's ball, by the way. <laughs> I'm answering an invitation from Lord Muckety Muck. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.